Once again, good evening. I'm glad you're all in good voice. It's, uh, it's good to hear you singing. Uh, tonight we're going to look at, uh, I guess it's possibly one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. It's the story of the penitent thief, which is the story of Christ on the cross with a thief on either side of him. And, uh, well, you'll see the text in your, in your programs there. But, you know, in commenting on this passage, Luke 23... J.C. Ryle wrote that these verses deserve to be printed in letters of gold. They have probably been the salvation of myriads of souls, multitudes. Well, thank God to all eternity that the Bible contains this story of the penitent thief. So as I read this, as you might notice, there's sort of three sets of actors in this passage. Firstly, there is the mediator, which is Jesus. Then there's the the mockers, the people who are participating or, or watching this scene that's going on. And thirdly, we have the malefactors, the two thieves on the cross. So let me read for us. This is Luke 23, starting at verse 32. <clears throat> two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let me just pray for us for, for, for the Father, you have given us your word as a lamp unto our feet. And so we ask now that you would be here with us to enlighten our minds and open our hearts to hear your word and maybe even to change. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've read the narrative now. And you see that Luke starts this narrative by telling us that there are two other men to be executed with Jesus. He calls them criminals. And we know from both Matthew and Mark's account, they tell us that they were robbers and bandits. And, we, you know, we don't really think too much about these men prior to this scene of them being standing before the cross. But, you know, just imagine these, these two men are standing there. They knew about crucifixion. I'm sure they had actually even seen crucifixion. They'd probably heard the cries of those men being nailed to the cross. And now they are standing there shrinking from the anticipation of the torture that was about to invade their entire being, that was just about to be imposed upon their own bodies. They were friendless, and they were alone, and they were about to be hung up and literally nailed to a wooden post. And Jesus was there too, and his heart went out to them. You see, they too were men for whom... He was about to die. And Luke says in verse 33 that they came to the place, the place where they were to be crucified. And it's surprising, you know, but no one knows why they called this place the skull. It's long been speculated that the name was from the shape of the hill on which Jesus was crucified. But as a matter of fact, <clears throat> none of the four gospel writers ever say anything about Jesus being crucified on the hill. And if you've ever been there to Jerusalem, you wouldn't have any idea which hill it was. And at the end of verse 34, it says they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
It was the custom that the clothing of the condemned man would be claimed by his executioners. And here, Jesus is really reduced to nothing. He is stripped of everything, even the clothes he had worn to the place of his execution. Nothing left at all, not even a small cover for his loins. And as he hangs up on the cross, he hears them splitting up his clothes. And when they come to the undergarment, the one huge piece of a single piece of cloth, well, they decided not to tear it in half. They decided to throw dice for it. And just imagine the chaos surrounding this. People rolling dice at the bottom of the cross, the passerbys, the markers yelling, the spectacle taking place. And here in the midst of this scene, Luke records that Jesus prayed for those people who were murdering him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And here we see Jesus as the mediator. His first thought was for others. He was the God man, the go-between. He, as, he, as they drove the nails into his body and dropped the base of his cross in the ground, he cried out for them. Father, forgive them. And you know, of all the cries that came from the victims of execution, surely none was more amazing than this. Just think about all that the Roman soldiers had heard. This would have been different from anything the Roman soldiers had ever heard before from a man being crucified. His sinless soul had no rancor, no resentment, no anger, no desire for revenge, just love and compassion for all of those people around him. And the soldiers who had grown accustomed to the threats and vile abuse that came from homes who they were nailing to these wooden posts. Soldiers who had heard the usual curses without end must have found themselves looking at each other saying, is he really saying forgive them? You see, Jesus had instructed his people to pray for those who abused them. And here as he hangs on the cross, he's simply practicing what he had preached. And this must be one of the most famous prayers in the world. Even people who don't know that much about prayers, many of them know that Jesus prayed this. But sadly, that's often the extent of, of what they know. But what is it that Jesus is saying? Well, what he's not saying is, that's okay, Father, pay no attention, let's not worry about this. Now, he is praying to his Father that those who are committing this atrocity, whether they are hammering in the nails or standing idly by and watching the spectacle. He is asking his father that they, by God's grace, may be brought to see that he actually is the Savior and that they are in need of a Savior and that he is opening up the way to eternal life through his death, which they are all witnessing. See, Jesus is praying that they might be brought to the understanding that here in his death, is forgiveness for their personal, individual sin. There's an old song we used to sing when I was a kid. It's a song that children learn, but it gives the idea of the personal, individual awareness of salvation. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, but now I am free, all because Jesus was wounded for me. You see, salvation is about a very personal awareness. And Jesus prays that they will be brought to that awareness, that understanding. And Jesus not only asks for forgiveness, he also enters a special plea, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, when I read that, I find that hard to believe, don't you? They don't know what they're doing. I mean, of course they knew what they were doing. The Jewish leaders had trumped up the charges. They had manipulated Pilate. Pilate had signed the papers of execution, the soldiers carried out their orders, and the crowds only hours before had been shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So what can Jesus mean? They do not know what they are doing. Well, what he is saying is this. They are aware of their actions, but they're not aware of the extent and the significance of their actions. The soldiers aren't aware of the fact that they are crucifying the Lord of glory the one whom the angels worship. And Jesus as the mediator is asking that these people who are doing this horrible atrocity might be brought to the understanding of, of how wrong their perspective is. 
In fact, he's praying that they might be brought to faith in him. So in these first verses, Luke shows us Jesus as the mediator. And then secondly, starting in verse 35, Luke shows us the mockers. And what we see here is the whole world is represented. The Hebrews, the Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans are all there. The worlds of religion, Hebrew religion, Greek culture, Roman power are all there. They're all united to witness and endorse the crucifixion of Christ. And as the religious leaders mock Jesus, they appear unaware that they are bearing witness to the reality of Jesus' amazing ministry. Look at verse 35. They admit that he performed miracles. They say, and he saved others. And a statement like that would have never been made, particularly by the Lord's enemies, unless it was common knowledge that, yes, he had performed all these miracles. He had healed the sick. He had raised people from the dead. He saved others, but he can't save himself, they say. But they readily admit the reality of the miracles. On the other hand, they do declare in a sneering tone that, well, they have finally put paid to this troublemaker. At verse 37, the soldiers join in with their own taunts. And the difference between the mockery of the Jewish rulers and the Roman soldiers is the Jews mocked Jesus as a helpless Messiah, unable to save himself and therefore unfit to be the savior of Israel. While the Roman soldiers, ignorant of the Jewish Messiah and the Jewish religion totally, they mocked him as a helpless king of the Jews, a king without a crown, without a kingdom, without an army, and not able to save himself. The Jews scoffed at his claim to be called the Messiah, and the soldiers scoffed at his claim to be regarded as a king. And in both cases, the apparent weakness of the cross seems to be the stumbling block. And then in verse 38, there's a sign. A sign over the cross was usual in order to identify the crime and for which the man was being executed. And it was a way of underlining the crime and, and emphasizing the deterrent effect of execution in this way. And on this occasion, Pilate used it to get his revenge on the Jewish leadership who had hounded him into doing something that he hadn't actually wanted to do. In John, his account, we read that the Jews came to Pilate and said, we would like to change that sign. We would like you to put, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. We don't want it to read, this is the king of the Jews. And do you remember Pilate's response? I have written what I have written. You see, Pilate is actually saying to the Jews, listen, you people have annoyed me intensely, and I'm going to put a sign up there that underlines the fact that you Jews are a subjected people and you do not have a king because this is your king and in case you should ever try to produce a king with a view to a kingdom well let this scene be a reminder to you of what the romans will do to him so let's just leave that sign there Pilate says this is the king of the jews so we've seen jesus as the mediator the mockers of the people and in verse 39 luke introduces us to the malefactors, the two criminals on either side of Jesus. You know, when they were first nailed to the cross, both of these criminals reviled Jesus. I mean, the outburst here in verse 39 was much worse. Many of the scholars who read these languages says that it just shows the intensifying nature of the abuse. And this time the man began to use insulting language. Luke implies it was incessant. His tone is ugly. It doesn't reflect any belief that Jesus is actually able to save them. It's sheer sarcasm. Verse 39, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. See, but notice, this is also the third time that we have seen this same taunt that Jesus must save himself. And in each case, it comes with the same idea. That self-deliverance is the proof for the genuineness of Jesus. You see, it's only a matter of time before this thief's breath gives out, before his ribcage caves in on him and squeezes the last breath of life out of his lungs. And still, he, he uses this dying breath to scream out, 
What kind of Messiah are you? But this man's not alone. I mean, the entire crowd agrees. They will know that Jesus really is the Messiah if he saves himself. Because if he does, well, if he, does, if he doesn't save himself, how can he possibly save anyone else? And even today, there are many who base their decision about Jesus on that same flawed logic. And in order to do that, then and now, a person must ignore the character of Christ. They must lay aside the claims of Christ. And they must remain unmoved by the compassion of Christ. And as the one thief spits out his hatred and ridicule, the other thief suddenly realizes the truth about Jesus. And he suddenly admits that he and the other criminal are getting precisely what they deserve. But that Jesus is innocent. And then in verse 42, the thief realizes that Jesus had the authority to bring him to glory. And you know, the irony here is apparent. Some of these people, many of them, had been eyewitnesses to Jesus' miracles. They had seen him raising people from the dead, and yet they were not able to believe in him. But here, this man saw Jesus himself apparently helpless, hanging from a cross, dying, and yet he found faith in Jesus. You know, such is the power of God over the heart and mind of a man or a woman. On the other hand, this raises the question, how much did this man really understand about Jesus, about the forgiveness of sin or the way of salvation or about what Jesus was doing there on the cross in the first place? Not a lot, I would say. But I think this underlines for us that we will never know how little Someone must believe in order to be saved. And what really seems to matter from this scene, what the message is that a man or a woman must lay hold of the fact that Jesus can do whatever needs to be done and then turn to him and plead with him for life. That seems to be the message. And in reply to this man's prayer, the Lord offers the man more than he could have possibly hoped for. Entrance into paradise immediately upon his death. Not simply forgiveness by some far distant means, but immediate reconciliation to God and immediate pleasure in a place of perfect peace and joy. Paradise is originally a Persian word that was used for a garden or a park. But as it was taken into the Greek and Hebrew, it came to be used to refer to the Garden of Eden or the final place of, of bliss, heaven. And you see, I think the emphasis here is not solely on the place, but it's also on the timing. You see, Jesus is not only affirming the fact that this man will go to heaven when he dies, but he also affirms that it will be today. You see, Jesus is good when he talks about today. He, uh, it's the immediacy of events. You may remember in Luke chapter four, Jesus reads the prophecy from Isaiah about the Messiah. It's his first public sermon. And he reads the prophecy about the Messiah being sent to bring good news to the poor and sight to the blind and so on. And then he rolls up the scroll and he hands it back to the attendant and he turns to the crowd and he says with the eyes of every person in the synagogue on him, he speaks and his first word out of his mouth is today. Today, he says, this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing. He claimed to be the Messiah. Not in some remote future. He was saying, I am the kingdom and the kingdom is here and it's today. Today, this prophecy is fulfilled within your hearing. Or do you remember the story of Zacchaeus, the little tax man? He wanted to meet Jesus. He climbs up in a tree. And when Jesus comes, he comes out of the tree. Jesus goes home with Zacchaeus. They have lunch. Later on, Jesus comes out on the porch. You know the story. You remember the first words out of his mouth. Today, salvation has come to this house. And here on the cross, he says, today, 
you will be with me in paradise. Today, not in some remote future. You see, this implies the immediate, full consciousness after death of the individual. Full consciousness of those who die and pass away in this life. And Jesus isn't saying that paradise is in some remote future, in some far off place after, or after some sort of limbo or purgatory or after I've been stuck in the ground for 500 years. No, Jesus says it's not like that. You see, this is an emphasis in the Bible, which is quite often on today because God deals in the immediate he deals in the now. Today is the day of salvation. Today salvation has come to this house. Today, paradise. And this day, this very day, is a day of salvation for those who will believe. You know, in John 17, Jesus is praying in the garden before his arrest. And he prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me. And so Jesus says to this criminal, I can do far better than to sort you out at some point in the future. Today, he says, you will be with me in my company and we will be in the place of perfect bliss. And you know, I'm certain that not long afterward, the Savior met this dying malefactor and took him with him into paradise. The first fruits of Calvary, possibly. You know, it strikes me that Luke tells the story of the actual crucifixion in just four words. There they crucified him. I mean, it's the central event in all of human history and only three or four words to explain it. It reads simply, they crucified him. And there's almost no effort to describe what Jesus must have endured. Nothing of the searing pain of the nails or the cramps in his, as his body hung there hour after hour and able to change its position. Nothing of the humiliation of being strung up naked in front of all your enemies. And, you know, I think the gospel writers understood that if they had focused on the physical suffering of Jesus, then the reader could have easily stopped there. The reader could easily come to a conclusion that once a person had been emotionally stirred or emotionally moved by this dreadful scene, then their sorrow just might be enough. That to feel sorrow is all a person needs to do. But you see, if we focus on the pain and the suffering, we might fail to see what the writers actually want us to see, and that is the reason for the cross. Why is Jesus having to suffer all this? You know, outside the Bible, much focus has been placed on the suffering of Jesus. I mean, especially in art over the last several hundred years. You just have to go to the National Gallery, the Tate, to, to see all the, the sorrow that's in the crucifixion of Jesus. You may also remember Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of Christ. It shows you how old I am. This is like 2004, 2005, but it was quite a big deal at the time. And if you've seen it, you'll remember the vivid horror and full cinematic color of the suffering and the physical abuse of Jesus. But you see, the film failed in the fact that it never got beyond the blood and the torture. In fact, it never explained why the cross had to happen, and it never even attempted to speak to that issue. And the problem lies in the fact that simply for Jesus stops short of faith in Jesus. A focus on Jesus as the sufferer does not necessarily lead a man or a woman to faith in Jesus as the Savior. And it's for that reason, I believe, that the gospel writers haven't focused on the suffering of Jesus. Instead, they focus on why Jesus was on the cross. They want us to see that on the cross, Jesus achieved salvation for the human race. And the fact that Jesus achieved salvation for us through dying on the cross is at the very center of biblical revelation. Everything before it looked towards it. Everything since looks back to it. Because you see, the cross is the watershed of all human history. And the account of these two thieves is a supreme illustration of this most fundamental fact. 
Now, I know many of you have heard me use this analogy of the watershed before, but it's an area or a ridge of land that separates waters flowing to different seas or rivers. One of the best examples is in the U.S., the Continental Divide. It is the watershed for the whole of the North American continent. The water which falls to the east ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. The water which falls to the west ends up in the Pacific. And as the snow melts at the watershed, the drops of water begin their journey, either east or west, depending on which side of the divide the snowplate fell. And I'm told that the watershed is so precise that in some cases, snowflakes that fell side by side, touching, but yet astride the divide, will end up thousands and thousands of miles apart. And in that way, the term watershed has come to mean a crucial turning point or dividing line that makes um, a serious separation. And the cross is such a watershed as it separates humanity. And as we look at these two thieves, crucified and dying on either side of Jesus, they illustrate the two great streams of people that move inexorably toward heaven or toward hell. One of those men mocks, the other believes. So one goes to paradise and the other doesn't. You know, there's so much reality to see in this brief narrative of these two men that in our familiarity with the story, I think we so often overlook it. I mean, in the first place, the, the depravity of man is here. These men were thieves. They made a living out of harming the lives of others. They were mockers, filled with a spirit of anger and pride. And these two thieves are easily every man and every woman. In fact, they are human and they are me. There's also the compassion of God here. We see his readiness to forgive, his willingness and determination to save. Even on the cross, we see him praying for those who were putting him to death. There's also the reality of eternal life in that word paradise. There's also the reality of conversion here. We see the fundamental transformation of human life by the power of God. The thief suddenly sees himself and he sees Jesus as they actually are. And this is the same conversation that takes place in everyone who is saved. It's the same conversion. And if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, then it took place in you. At one point where what was literally, utterly dark and opaque to both these criminals suddenly became as clear and as bright as the noonday sun to one of them. There's also the reality of divine grace, of salvation as a gift of God to the unworthy. The thief has just about finished his life. He has lived it badly, but here, at the very end of his life, all the evil was swept away and he would find himself among the righteous in heaven. You know, I think we have watered down grace, but in fact, when you look at it like this, grace is a very radical idea, isn't it? I mean, do you think the man's victims would have been happy to learn that he walked straight out of his punishment into paradise? But that is the nature of salvation for everyone. And it has to be that way because we are all alike. We're all like the thief in many more ways than we realize or are willing to accept. No sinner has ever been saved in any other way than his or her lifetime of sins against God and his fellow man are swept away in an instant by the powerful grace of God. There's the reality of unbelief here. Unbelief impervious to change. We see it in the thief who remained impenitent. He had seen the same things his fellow thief had seen. But he didn't find paradise that day. And supremely and lastly, I guess there is the reality of Jesus Christ himself. The savior of the world. The person who alone, alone can bring us to God and to heaven. I mean, is there a more amazing thing that you can imagine than this thief turning to Jesus and asking for help and Jesus promising the thief everlasting life that very day? I mean, no one else can do that, you see. As the penitent thief confessed, Jesus Christ, Jesus promised him paradise. 
no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Just the one, Jesus. So you see, you take these truths together, and what you have is a biblical philosophy of life. They are the facts that every man must learn, but so many refuse to even look at them seriously, much less try to learn them. But they are the facts that separate human beings into two groups. Those who embrace the cross as the salvation of the world and those who do not. You see, the cross is truly the watershed of humanity. And vast is that chasm that separates the two groups of human beings that reside in the world. I mean, however close they may be, however they may jostle with one another in their daily lives, like the snowflakes astride the summit of the watershed. They fall away in different directions. One group heading to heaven and the other group not. And as it was that day with these two thieves, so it remains today. One person mocks, the other believes. And how similar these two men appear to us. They were both thieves. They had both lived lives of crime. They had both been caught. They were both being punished and they were both about to die. But at the very last, one saw that Jesus held the keys to life eternal and the other never saw it. And so while, while they were hanging there, suspended on a cross between heaven and hell, they began moving apart, moving away from the watershed until they were separated by a chasm that no man can cross. You know how this works? I can't say. It really is a mystery. A couple come together to church. They hear the same sermons. They hear the same scriptures. They pray the same prayers. They sing the same songs, the same words. And one leaves thinking, what in the world was that all about? And the other leaves thinking, I think I believe. We know not how the spirit moves, convincing men and women of sin. Revealing Jesus through the word and creating faith in him. How this actually works, I can't say. But for any of you who who are not yet sure that you will be in paradise at the end of the day, I urge you to look again at the thief who, who by faith in Jesus on the cross stepped directly from his execution to the right hand of God. You know, when I was preparing this, I had this image of a long line of people stretching as far as the eye could see. The whole of humanity lined up single file, walking toward the cross. I could see my friends, my neighbors, my family, mixed in amongst millions of people I have never known or even seen. The whole of humanity walking toward the cross. But looking up on the very front of the queue, up on the horizon, you could see the line dividing into two lines. Some passing the cross on the right, some passing on the left. One group on their way to paradise, the other group on their way to eternal torment. And I think we have the two thieves to thank for that picture of what is happening in our world. We must all decide at some point. We must all pass by the cross. Some will pass to the left, some will pass to the right. Which direction for you when you walk by the cross? You see, there is nothing like this in all religion. Paul, the Apostle Paul, tries to give us a bit of insight in 1 Corinthians. He says that the cross is foolishness to some. It's a stumbling block to others, but to the one who believes, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's that kind of transformation we see here in the penitent thief as he believes. He sees Jesus, he prays for life, and Jesus promises him salvation that very day. I mean, what a, what a prayer, what a promise, and what a Savior. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, help us with these familiar words so that we might be drawn afresh to the cross of Christ. Help us to give up our pride and, and all the excuses we have for not facing up to the fact that it is forgiveness that we so desperately need. Grant that none of us may be content with a sympathy for a perfect sufferer, but 
Grant that we might be brought to a comprehending faith in a wonderful Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.